D'acord. Hello, everyone. My name is Margarita Gueleta, and it's a pleasure to present a project on which I have been working for 15 weeks, titled Pix Involved, Hiding Pixels in Music with Deep Steganography. And before going with the explanation, I want to thank my supervisor, Xavier Giro, my advisors, Christian Canton and Kevin McGuinness, and also the knowledge, the support of Jordi Pons, and of course, Cristina Punti. Actually, this project is a continuation of Cristina Punti's bachelor thesis on image steganography, and I extended it to audio steganography. I want to ask you a question. Here we, here we can see some images. Can you see something strange on those images? They are of low resolution, 32 by 32 pixels, but do you see anything? And if you, I give you the same images here and the images from the previous slide, can you see some differences? Can you spot anything? I think that you can see that there are some colors that are different, but the essence is the same. And the thing is that in these images, we have hidden these images. We just have enclosed some other images within other images. And this is called image steganography. In my project, what I have done is instead of using as cover, as cover signals images, I thought, what if we encode information within audio? In this way, we could transmit information through sound. And that was the challenge, the motivation for this project. So we'll start with audio steganography. Some definitions. Steganography formally is a method in which secret information is hidden in a cover media. And it is important to know that it differs in, in differs of cryptography in, in a way that in steganography, the fact that a secret communication is taking place is hidden, whereas in cryptography it is not. You know that there is a secret communication, but the message is encrypted in such a complex way that it is computational and feasible to decrypt it with exhaustive search, for example. And the complexity of steganographic methods relies on, on the difficulty of attaining three objectives at once, which are namely perceptual transparency, which is the ability to avoid suspicions, how similar is the original signal with the signal with the secret information, the embedded capacity, which is the maximum secret message size per one time or one space unit, depending whether you're enclosing in a image or audio, and robustness, which is the ability to withstand intentional or accidental signal attacks. For example, if you take an image and compress it, will you be able to extract again the secret image within it? And not so many algorithms attain two of those objectives. I'm not saying about three objectives at once. It is interesting to see uh, the history of audio steganography as a division of how audio representation was done through history. And we can see two streams. We had the cognitivist, which relied on high level representations of audio, which is basically music notation symbols, symbols uh, which we use in music. And we have the psychoacousticians, which focus on low level representations, the spectral representation of audio. And at the beginning, we had um, connectionist approaches, connectionist, um, the most famous are the neural networks, that just Get, got for input symbolic information and then outputted some, yielded some output. But now we, are, we have shifted to this representation, a spectral representation of audio. Why has this happened? Basically, because in the cognitive, cognitive approach, we find some issues. Here we are encoding, let's meet at 4 a.m. with symbolic notation. It may be easy for text because it is a discrete alphabet, but when you want to quantize with a discrete set of symbols something continuous, it becomes difficult. You cannot do that. If you, if you wanted to encode here an image or an audio signal, that would not be easy. Also, it is difficult to encode sounds which are not harmonic. For example, how would you encode with symbolic notation a uh, noise? It's not, uh, it's not trivial. That's why researchers sought for other representations of audio. And actually, the cochlea, which is the inner organ in the ear that resembles a snail, 
works like a frequency analyzer. All the sounds that in come to the ear, it represents as spectral variations, just like the mathematical transforms we may know, like the short time Fourier transform, short time cosine transform. These allow us to go from the temporal domain to the spectral do to the frequency domain. And that's why researchers have thought that it is biologically intuitive to use these kind of representations. Using these kind of representations, researchers thought that we could use the ultrasonic range and infrasonic ranges to hide information because these are the ranges where ears are insensitive to. And actually, ultra and infrasonic steganography does exist, but it's sometimes not um, appropriate because not all devices are capable to transmitting or uh, capturing these sounds, these frequencies. So we will focus on steganography within earshot. And here we've, we can find some classic algorithms which are in yellow that achieve two of three objectives. All those algorithms I have implemented on my own and I will show you the experimental results I had. The first one, the LSB algorithm, attains the perceptual transparency in the mailing capacity data rate. And it is easy as this. You just take the bits of the secret message and you hide them within the bytes of the cover audio. I want to show you a sample. So let's hear the original sound. The original sound is like this. And now we'll see the LSB with each when, when we use each byte. I think that you can hear some noise at the background. And actually it is a low power additive white Gaussian noise. Why does this happen? Because we're corrupting some bits of the original signal and this adds this noise. To avoid this, we can use not every byte, but every two bytes, every three bytes and so on. And if we use every four bytes, it sounds like this. And it sound, it sounds like the original, but it is not because we have some hidden information there. Face coding. Face coding attains robustness and transparency. As you may know, when we pass from the temporal domain to the frequency domain, we obtain the magnitude of a waveform and also the phase. An interesting thing about the phase is that the human auditory system is insensitive to constant shifts in the phase. And what we do here is to encode information within the phase. And what happens is that at the beginning we have a small shift, but if you are not aware of that, you don't notice it. And I will show you. Attention. I don't know if you have noticed, but just at the beginning we had a small shift and that's, and that's all. We have hidden some information there. Finally, the last classic algorithm is echo hiding. It does not attain transparency, but it does that in such a smart way that it sounds so natural because it encodes information with echoes. That is, imagine I want to encode a string of bits like this, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, etc. What I do is to, in each segment, I encode uh, the same signal with a specific delay. I have a specific delay for bit zero and a specific delay for bit one. And when I, and when I analyze this signal, when I encounter different, de different delays, I detect whether it is a zero or a one. And just to show you a sample of echo hiding, there, there is some echo in the background and this helps us to, to hide data. Now that we have seen all these classic methods, let's dive into deep steganography. What are the state-of-the-art deep steganography architectures? This is actually what Christina has been doing. This architecture is a bit different. It differs from her work, but the idea is the following. Imagine I want to hide this um, nice cat and this pretty dog. First of all, we pre-process each image with a pre-processing network. Then we combine those images with a hiding network. We obtain the dog with a hidden cat within it. 
And finally, we use the reveal network to extract this cat from this image of the dog. And the reconstruction error we use to train this network is the addition of the reconstruction error within the secret and the revealed image and the cover image of the dog with the container stego image of the dog, which contains the cat. In my proposal, what I do is instead of using the dog's image, we change it by a spectrogram, an audio. And as you may expect, an audio, uh, a spectrum is not square. It has a specific length. That's why we use the preprocessing network to extract features of this spectrogram to obtain the same size representation so that we can combine it well with the image. And as you can also expect, the spectrum is not given as a row. We get the waveform and the waveform has to be transformed to the spectral domain to the frequency domain so that's why we use transforms and finally we again use the reconstruction error between images to train the network and we add a reconstruction error between the sound files however later in practice i saw that the best reconstruction error that works is not between waveforms but between spectrograms and these are the visualizations I have done with TensorBoard. During this project, I have learned to use TensorBoard. And here we can see the whole architecture I have implemented of the network. And when we go part by part, we can see that at the beginning, we have the preprocessing network. Uh, all the network is done uh, with inception-like modules. That is, we extract features of different kernel sizes, 3x3, 4x4, and 5x5. In the parts where we have to use subsampling, I have put transposed convolution layers and the same um, inception-like modules in the re reveal network. An important note is about the transform. Usually researchers uh, have used the short time for year transform to extract features of the audio and then do some kind of classification or whatever task they need to do. But in my case, since I have to go back to the waveform, domain, uh, it is a bit difficult. It introduces issues because we lose the face. We have some algorithms to, for face reconstruction, but it introduces some noticeable artifacts which are not good for reconstruction. So again, in my proposal, what I have introduced is a short, the short time for, yeah, sorry, the short time cosine transform because it just works with reals. It has no face. It only has coefficients, which can be switched back and, and again to the temporal domain without any problems and with almost zero loss reconstruction. And I will show you here this plot. Here is the original waveform. This, is, this one is from short time Fourier transform with Griffin limb reconstruction of the face. And the distance, the mean square distance is quite a huge. And if we use the short time cosine transform in number three, it's almost exactly the distance is nearly zero. And the fourth is reconstruction from using only the magnitude, which is bad. And in case of only using the magnitude, I want to show you a sample so that you see the importance of the face. You, you may not remember the original, I'll show it again. This is the original sound and the sound without face. It, it's horrible, we have lost everything. So that's why we continue with short time cosine transform. At the beginning, I thought of um, training an, a separate audio intercoder, but the results were pretty, pretty poor. And that's why I decided to train all the subnets in an end-to-end -end model just to plug everything and train it all together. And that's what I have done. Again, uh, just to know that everything was based on inception-like modules. And when I used the transposed convolutional layers, it, it led to the appearance of checkerboard effect, which is, uh, which is quite fatal for audio reconstruction. That's why later I have switched to bilinear interpolation of sampling. And just to make it all easier, I got rid of the 4x4 kernels. So I left 
all the inception models with three by three and five by five and bilinear interpolation of sampling. Also, I had to keep track of the values of the coefficient values because it's important for reconstruction. And I have played with different activation functions and the best which work was the leaky ratio. Remember that earlier I mentioned that the waveform uh, loss reconstruction was a bit um, worse than the spectrum reconstruction. And I think that here visually, uh, graphically, you can see the effect. When, you, when we're using waveform reconstruction, the image is really highlighted in contrast to the waveform, sorry, um, spectrum reconstruction. Finally, since I haven't been able to hide the image um, completely in the spectrum, what I decided to do is debug the, the neural network. Um, how? Training the network for independent objectives. That is, first, I got rid of the image reconstruction loss. I thought I will train the network only for reconstructing well the spectrum. And that's what I have done. I achieved nearly zero reconstruction uh, loss. And the result was this. Actually, the image was hidden well. There are some variations uh, still. Uh, we need to train it more, more, more time, more iterations. And the image is not uh, able to, to extract back. Uh, that's OK, because we, we haven't trained the network for that aim. Because the error of the image meant it was maintained constant. And then I put beta 1. I got rid of the spectrum reconstruction loss. And I just trained the network for image reconstruction. And again, it almost achieved zero reconstruction also, mean squared error. And the result was this. And you may think, why? Why we have no green grass and we have these strange saturations on the, on the dog? And I think that this is due to saturations that um, are given by the RGB uh, by the gradients that we have in the RGB channels because I haven't normalized the images. And now we go to the next steps. And the first thing is the next step. What I would do is normalize the RGB um, channels to avoid these kind of saturations. Also, it can um, help in the training process because the gradients won't have strange values in each channel. Also, adding residual connections may ease the training process and also avoid these saturations. Christina, Christina has used uh, the unit-like architecture, and I think that adding skip connections can be really useful in this case. So that would be something that I would do afterwards. Also, speeding up the, da the data loading, I think it's crucial because now to train that huge network, it takes six days to to end at one epoch uh, i never done that i only used um, as a maximum uh, 200 iterations it never achieved the the whole epoch with the available computational resources and a way to speed up the process is using embedded databases like the lightning memory database so that would be also an option to try and finally i think it's also a clue uh, changing the error metrics because I have used the mean squared error and the mean absolute error, which are not the most suitable for not the most suitable metrics for human vision, for human vision and hearing. I would switch to perceptual metrics like the signal to noise ratio. It always comes to the mind the image of the the same the same mean squared error hypersphere. You may have the same mean squared error with different images which are perceptually very different so that i think we should change the um, the loss function for training that network and that's all i think i've i end now if you have any questions i'm open i'm all ears and thank you for your attention <laughs>